Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, the Stockton Geology Open House. Um, I wanted to give you guys a brief overview of what the what geologists do in general, what the geology major is, and what kind of careers you can expect to potentially get after graduating from Stockton, and also just a little bit of details about what our program is in particular, um, and the advantages of that we have in, uh, over a lot of our other schools and things. So um, I wanted to kind of go through a little bit of an overview of what our the program is, uh, what our who our faculty are, and what kind of things that we're going to do. Because probably the biggest thing that most of you don't realize is the fact that geology is a very traditional science, but it's also one of the only sciences that is not taught in most high schools across the country, particularly anywhere east of the Mississippi. Um, so most people do not realize that geology is a major that you can uh, explore in college, and also just the importance that geologists play in the broader perspective of uh, society. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to try to touch base with today uh, to give you guys kind of a little bit better idea about what geologists do. So we're going to go through a little bit of a presentation that I have and on the program first, and then I can answer any questions that people may have uh, as we go forward. And the other thing is you can always contact me. Uh, my name is Rocky Sievers. Uh, my official name is Matthew. I've had the nickname Rocky since I was a child, uh, long before I ever became a geologist. So I guess it was just luck that I ended up in this field. So you can always feel free to contact me if you ever have any questions uh, through my email at uh, matthew.sievers at stockton.edu. So we're going to go through the, uh, the a couple of uh, aspects of, of the program here. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have later on down the line. So these are just a couple of pictures. They give you kind of a good idea of the, the importance that our program places on field work. Um, the top left picture is a picture that uh, I took about eight years ago with two of my former students uh, when we were out at Mount St. Helens out in uh, Washington State, uh, which is home of the famous 1980 uh, volcanic eruption, and we were out there doing field work, and you can see that I had both of the two of them. Uh, both of them went on, on to uh, ver have very successful careers. Uh, currently, one is in Nevada, and the other one is here in New Jersey. The bottom right picture shows the uh, mineralogy uh, class, where we were up in the Adirondacks for an extended weekend uh, field trip. Uh, to talk about the various minerals that are present up in the Adirondacks uh, and talk about some of the overall geology of the area. And you can see that this is a, a fairly well-known covered bridge located in Jay, and we were very close to it, looking at the rocks there uh, in particular. So just a little bit about the geology program. The two geology professors are myself um, and my colleague, Dr. Jeff Weber, uh, who this is him on the top left picture. This is obviously another picture of me, maybe with slightly a little bit more hair, longer hair. Um, all of the additional faculty members who teach geology classes or affiliated classes have primary appointments in either the environmental science program, like Emma Witt and Jess Favorito on the right side, um, Dr. Suzanne Moskowski from the Marine Science Faculty on the left side, and then our two paleontologists are in the biology program, Matt Bonin and Margaret Lewis. I also put my uh, uh, emeritus colleague, Dr. Mike Hozik, uh, in the lower left picture, who is still around and still comes to various events and, uh, and, and, and participates around the program. So that's who we are as a program. So it, while we only have two faculty members whose primary appointment is in geology, you can see that we have a broader base of faculty members that are in other programs. So it's kind of nice that it enables us to teach a broader perspective of classes than a lot of other uh, similar size schools might be able to teach. So for example, Jess Favorito teaches soil science and soil chemistry. Uh, which are not necessarily classes that you might get at a lot of smaller schools uh, with a geology program. So 
probably the biggest question that all of you guys are asking is what do geologists do for a living? And can you actually make a living doing geology? And this is probably the most common misconception that people have that people uh, have a tendency to just think of geology as, oh, you look at rocks all day. And while some of us do look at rocks a lot, um, it is certainly not one of the only things that geologists do. And the careers that people get after they have a geology degree can be very diverse in terms of what kinds of fields they can get into. Now, these are, um, there are a lot of different types of careers within the geosciences. And uh, this is data that was taken from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2018. Um, you'll see another figure for the 2019 data, which is ever so slightly different. Um, but this particular field figure shows you the variations in salaries that you can get uh, for a wide variety of different kinds of subfields that geologists oftentimes end, end up in. So you can see that the traditional kind of generic geoscientists, they all plot up in here and they earn about $91,000. Now this is across the entire board, uh, all whether or not they are doing environmental consulting, whether they are working for a mining company, whether they're working for the federal government. So 91,000 is the median uh, salary across the board. Um, you can see other kinds of fields like hydrologists. These are geologists who focus on water in particular. Uh, they earn a little bit less, but still way higher than the average U.S. salary of only 38,000. Um, you can also see there are also fields and careers in here that typically do not require a bachelor's degree like some of these technician type of positions, which are typically the lower paying kinds of salaries that are out there. So when we focus just on um, the average geoscientists and, and excluding some of the, the additional fields that are, are a little further afield, such as say the engineering managers or uh, civil engineers or things like uh, geographers. You can see that when we typically look at the values for, this is last year's data from 2019 from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Again, the median geoscientist is at 91.5. Mining and geological engineers earn about 91,000. Hydrologists are up a little bit more from up to 81,000. Environmental scientists earn about 71,500. Uh, average physical scientists earn about 81,000 in general. So it gives you an idea that geoscientists get paid very well to do what they're doing. Now, you're probably asking yourselves, what do they do in particular? And this is probably, again, the most common uh, lack of understanding of what geology is and what we do in particular. Uh, the other thing that is also really important is the fact that this is a very, uh, very much a growth kind of industry. There is a lot of discussion that the number of geoscientists is going to drastically increase. If you look at the average value for the percent increase over the next five to 10 years, the job growth, according to, again to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is about somewhere between 9 and 13 percent, depending on the specific type of geoscience careers that you're going into. If you contrast that with the average national science averages, uh, they come out to about seven, seven and a half percent. So geoscientists are expected to be much more highly in demand than a lot of other fields that are currently out there. And again, this is one of these things that people don't know because geology is usually not taught at the high school. Every once in a while you might find that you have an earth science kind of class, but it's usually taught at a more simplistic kind of level and doesn't really make you aware of the kinds of careers that are out there. Now, the kinds of careers that are out there can be very uh, diverse in terms of what you can find yourselves working in. For example, most of our students end up working in either environmental geology or in what I would call either engineering geology or geotechnical kinds of engineering. So environmental geology can be things looking at water quality, um, things that are looking at Thing, uh, aspects like soil erosion, uh, aspects of dealing with things like landfills and how to make them properly safe so that they do not pollute, or looking at, again, uh, pollution that is already currently there and figuring out means of remediating it. These are all kinds of fields that 
uh, environmental consultants and environmental geologists will be highly in demand for. The other, one of the other major areas that is of extreme importance is earth resources. One of the classic phrases that we say in geology is the fact that if it's not grown, it's mine. And that's because of the fact that people don't realize that literally everything that you are using short of paper products and occasionally certain kinds of cloths that are coming from, from uh, natural fibers and things like that, pretty much everything that you use is coming from the ground in some way, shape, or form. And some of you guys are probably thinking of, of more traditional kinds of things like the gold that's in the lower left kind of picture. Um, but it also includes the importance of the rare earth elements, which most of you guys probably may have not have heard of. But these are the lanthanide series for the most part that are at the bottom of the periodic table. And this is a, these are particularly important for most modern kinds of technologies like your cell phone or things like solar cells, solar panels, uh, electric batteries for vehicles. All of these kinds of advanced kinds of instruments and tools and things need these rare earth elements. So finding the deposits of these kinds of materials is of the utmost importance. Um, and some of you guys probably may have heard in the news of, of the rare earth elements from the fact that China uh, recently, they control the dominant supply of rare earth elements that are currently mined. So finding additional deposits of them has been a very high priority for the federal government, for example. So it also includes earth resources that some of you might not necessarily think of are, are as important, but others of you might think of it from the, the gemology and or jewelry kind of aspect, but things like emeralds. You don't necessarily realize it, but we, we use pretty much everything uh, that we can get out of the ground, whether it's for making roads uh, in the aggregate industry, whether it is making building uh, materials like your, the gypsum in your wallboard, or whether it's mining salt that we need for our diet. All of these various things come back into play. Probably the other most highly recognizable type of career that most people think geologists are gonna be likely to do is work in geologic hazards. And this can include everything from thinking about volcanic kinds of eruptions, like the picture on the left side from Pericatin in Mexico back in the 1940s, um, or whether we're thinking about massive kinds of earthquakes and tsunamis, like the picture in the lower right-hand side showing you from uh, a particular uh, shot from the uh, Fukushima earthquake and subsequent tsunami that happened a few years back. So geologists are the ones who are going to study these kinds of natural hazards, and they're going to be the ones that oftentimes are trying to come up with ways to mitigate them, to prevent them in some cases, uh, or they are going to be the ones that are gonna to try to clean up afterwards. Uh, this is earthquake damage taken from the uh, 1989 uh, California earthquake. Some of these other kinds of geologic hazards, that, this is probably an image that's probably seared into a lot of your minds. Uh, thinking about Superstorm super storm Sandy, um, and obviously it was previously a hurricane, but thinking about the flooding that occurs, uh, whether it's flooding that is occurring from coastal kinds of activity or whether it is river kind of flooding, whether they are what we call urban floods or downstream floods. These are the kinds of natural disasters that are most likely to affect the average person in their lifespan. Um, and having a good understanding of where the water is going, where it is trying to move to, and thinking about ways that we can mitigate this is really important and they require geologists to do a lot of this work. You also think larger scale, you think about massive kinds of, of Im impacts, literally like the uh, meteor crater out in Arizona, like this picture is, is taken of from the Behringer crater. But we think about the importance of the fact that these kinds of massive impacts of uh, bolides can cause significant damage. And NASA, for example, usually has a, a team of geologists that they correspond with to think about how to handle this kind of material. 
Um, you also think about major kinds of landslides and other types of mass movements. Um, this is all coming back again to geology because geologists are the ones that typically are going to go through and try to identify areas that are prone to these kinds of mass movements. And this is the second most common type of natural disaster that the average person is going to experience in, during their life. And in most cases, it's probably not necessarily going to kill you, but it can cause significant economic kind of damage to uh, your, your buildings, your cars, roadways, etc. It also includes things like sinkholes and understanding karst topography and cave systems. All of these come back to uh, having a good understanding of the geology. One of the other major areas that geologists contribute to is our understanding of how climate change is taking place. And these are a couple of uh, marine geologists taking samples from a coral. Um, and, and in this case, they're trying to look at what is the long-term kind of record of how climate has changed on our planet. Um, I have colleagues you know, elsewhere who are glaciologists who look at how glaciers are melting and permafrost and thinking about how these kinds of uh, impacts are going to affect society and affect our planet as a whole. So understanding climate change is, goes beyond just, say, the, uh, the most recent hundred years worth of data or so from, say, atmospheric collection of temperature and gas, CO2 levels, and things like that. So it's the geologists typically that are the ones that look into the deeper time to figure out what happened 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, a million years ago. The last kind of thing that people don't realize is the fact that there are significant interactions between the biological kind of community and the geological kind of community. Uh, and in particular, microbes uh, play a very significant role in terms of how minerals are created in the near surface kind of environment uh, or in some cases how they're broken down and the picture on the top right is of a particular kind of microbe called uh, Schuonella. It's a type of bacteria that is digesting basically a, a, an iron bearing mineral. And so these kinds of uh, what we oftentimes refer to as geomicrobiology or microbiology microbiology or geobiochemistry, all of these different kinds of fields require an understanding of both the mineralogical side and the biological kind of side of things. We also think about areas where understanding how life developed on our planet. Uh, and this is a picture that uh, I took when I was on a research cruise back when I was an undergrad a long time ago, uh, looking at the black smoker communities on the East Pacific rise. And understanding how the microbes, the bacteria there in particular, uh, may be analogs for how life on our planet form. Or if not there, someplace like hot springs in Yellowstone, for example. These kinds of thermophilic kind of bacteria are, they thrive on either the, the minerals themselves or on the hydrothermal fluids that are coming out of these different kinds of vent communities. So all of these different kinds of, uh, of areas give potential kinds of careers that people can get into. So some of these geology, biology type of interfaces, these will commonly be dealing more with academic kind of research, but again, particularly what we call the bioremediation, bio this oftentimes gets tied back into environmental geology again. So the last thing that I kind of want to point out is, again, comes back to this whole question of earth resources. And that's because, again, whenever we look at pretty much everything that you use in your life, it is coming from the ground. And that means that you have to mine it and process it. And in order to mine it and process it efficiently, it has to be done environmentally friendly. And it also has to be found in the first place. So this, this image that uh, I utilized from the Minerals Education Coalition, gives you kind of a brief uh, overview of some, not all of the different kinds of minerals that you will use during your lifespan as the average American, um, where you're gonna need a little over 12,000 pounds of clay, for example. And you don't necessarily realize this, but this goes into making all of the ceramics that you use, whether it is the ceramics that you use in your uh, kitchen for your, uh, eating and plates and things, or whether these are the high temperature kinds of ceramics that go into your uh, automobiles or into lots of the, the kinds of furnaces that we use to make 
all of the metal objects that we use. You think about things like bauxite. This is a mineral that is the primary ore for the metal aluminum. Every time you think of an aluminum can of some type, you'll think about the fact that that's where the aluminum is coming from, is the mineral bauxite. And you need a little over 6,000 pounds of that in your lifespan. So again, all of this comes back to the fact that we have to be able to find this, these different kinds of minerals and metals, be able to process it, and be able to do everything in an environmentally responsible kind of fashion. So Stockton's geology program is a very successful one. Um, I, over the past 10 years that I've been present at Stockton, this is the end of my 10th year, um, we have sent students off to about roughly 100 different kinds of companies that are out there. So this list that I, I'm showing you is far from complete. Um, it is only a selection of different kinds of jobs and careers that, that people have had. So you can see that there are some of these that are international kinds of companies like Chevron, um, or whether they are major federal government agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers or the EP Environmental Protection Agency, or whether they work for state agencies like the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection or the Florida Department of Health. Most of the students end up working in either environmental consulting or geotechnical engineering. And these kind of companies can be things like the international, national kind of ones like Langen or uh, Kleinfelder, or whether they're working for smaller kind of companies like TRC or um, Princeton Hydro. We also have students that have gone on to teach in the uh, K to 12 kind of education districts. Um, I, I put two of the, the different districts that people are, uh, we have alumni working at, Millville here in New Jersey, and then the Anne Arundel County uh, Public School District in Maryland. We also have a few others uh, scattered across the country. The other thing I also want to point out is the fact that a lot of these companies are all around the states. Um, again, we, the one student who works for the Army Corps of Engineers works in their Oregon office. Uh, we have several students who are all working out in Colorado. Um, Again, the important thing about Stockton's geology program is that we prepare the students to be qualified to go on and work anywhere around the world. And you'll see that here in one second, uh, where we look at some of the students who have gone on to graduate school for either a master's degree or a PhD. You can see that we have sent students all over the entire planet. We have students that have graduated with a master's from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. We have several students who've gone to Canadian universities like the University of Windsor or Memorial University. Uh, we have a student who went down to the University of Christchurch in New Zealand. Um, and again, this is only data from the past 10 years. Um, this list is again, not exhaustive by any means, but you can see we, we send people all over our own country, whether they're currently out in uh, Northern Arizona, like one of my students who graduated two years ago, uh, or whether it's a little closer to home like Rutgers or Temple. So our students are very successful wherever they go. And as a general rule of thumb over the last 10 or 11 years of data, of the, all of the graduates, 92% of them are all working specifically doing geoscience or science education, such as the, uh, the two students who are working in the Millville Public School District or the uh, Anne Arundel. Uh, the only remaining percentage of people who are not are either people who I don't know where they currently are or who have decided to go into more just traditional kinds of business. Typically family business is the most common. So Stockton's geology program does an excellent job of preparing students for a wide variety of different types of careers uh, and success, not just here in New Jersey and in the mid Atlantic, but around the entire globe. Now, the other big thing about Stockton's geology program that makes us a little more special is the fact that we place an extreme uh, premium on field experiences. And our graduates are constantly told after they get hired by whatever their company is or their graduate students, graduate schools, that they are better prepared for field studies than almost all of their competitive colleagues. Uh, I've been told this personally by uh, graduate advisors from other schools as well as from companies that are currently out there. And that's because of the fact that we start 
going on field trips in the introductory geology classes, whether it's the physical geology class or the historical geology class. These are pictures that were taken from the two ones on the right side are taken from North Jersey, close to the Delaware River. And the one that's in the lower left side is taken from the greater Philadelphia area where we take a two separate day trips uh, on Saturdays for the introductory classes. All of the upper level classes typically go on either a, an extended weekend kind of trip or they will go up for, for a very long kind of full day Saturday kind of trip. Uh, so my mineralogy class that I teach, we typically go up to the Adirondacks every, every other year when we teach this class. Um, and we see where, say, for example, most of the garnet that goes into making sandpaper comes from. Uh, that's this lower left picture. Uh, we see one of the old abandoned iron mines that was extremely important, both uh, for iron and later for titanium. Uh, that's in the top left picture. And then also where the uh, a mineral called wollastonite is mined in the lower right picture. Uh, and wollastonite gets used for adding a lot of strength and durability to uh, plastics, for example. So all of the, uh, the kind of dent resistant plastic that they put on cars, for example, that is almost always uh, created by adding wollastonite to it. Um, and we get it, that's an active mine. The other two are currently inactive. Uh, the garnet mine, they've moved their main operations um, away from where this picture is. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for students to see uh, geology outside. Our other upper level classes, I take my petrology class to Connecticut and Rhode Island, and they get a very uh, strong background in both the igneous and metamorphic rocks in the area, but we also tie everything back in with the overall tectonics of how our, the Appalachians have been formed over the last 700 million years or so. My colleague Jeff Weber takes the structure class and the field geology class to various locations in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Vermont. Um, he varies them up typically year to year. So uh, for example, the structure geology trip last not last year, but the year before. Uh, that trip started off in Vermont, made its way through Massachusetts, and ended up in kind of north central Pennsylvania. Uh, the field geology class went up to uh, uh, Vermont, if I remember specifically. Um, but again, they, they will go all over the place uh, for day trips as well. The other thing that makes Stockton geology a little more unique and special is the fact that our undergraduate students are always going to be involved in faculty research projects or in internships. And it's a requirement for all of the students to actively do either an internship or to partake in a research project during their time at Stockton. Um, and, and it's probably about a third of them get internships and about two thirds of them do research, but it varies from year to year. Um, generally speaking, most of the faculty research always incorporates students in it in various ways. Um, and you'll see here in a minute some examples of some of them. But we typically go all over the country again for our research projects. Um, you can also see that there are a couple that are outside of the, uh, the country here in Canada. Um, but you can see we have a lot of projects here in kind of the East Coast, places like the Adirondacks again, up in Northern Jersey and uh, Southern New York, over through places like Maine. But we also have some projects that are currently ongoing from places like Arizona and Montana. Um, so just to give you guys kind of an idea about a couple of these different kinds of projects, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you want to look at more of them, you can find them uh, either on our website or if you contact the faculty in particular, they can give you more details. So one of the projects that I'm currently working on with a bunch of my students is looking at former iron mines here in New Jersey and Southern New York and looking to see whether or not there could be elevated and economic quantities of some of these rare earth elements again. Uh, and that's because of the fact that other people have found that iron mines, some of which are abandoned and some of which are not uh, elsewhere in, in both the U S and around the world do have elevated quantities of rare earth elements in them. 
and so that's that's kind of where we're we're looking for in these particular uh, places, because again, in a lot of these old mines, there are huge piles of what we call tailings, basically the leftovers that were left from when they actually mined them out in the eighteen early eighteen hundreds, mid eighteen hundreds, up in some cases through the early nineteen hundreds. So in some cases, these mines may have economic quantities of these rare earth elements. And so we're trying to, to, to see whether or not we can find this. Uh, another project that I'm currently working on with my students is we're trying to look at volcanic and plutonic igneous rocks from Arizona and trying to tie them to, together specifically and then also trying to put them into a greater tectonic kind of framework of how these rocks were formed. Um, and you can see that this is a picture you'll see a little later on when we come to the geology club um, of where we actually did a lot of this field work while we were out there on the club trip. Um, and so it's an excellent opportunity to get involved with a variety of different projects. Another kind of project that I'm working on is looking at understanding what is the character of the mantle beneath us and in particular uh, the mantle below Rhode Island. Uh, as it was starting to separate off uh, from uh, Africa and uh, Western Europe. Um, and that's through a group of volcanic dikes that are found in this one little area in Rhode Island, and they carry up chunks of the mantle is what we call xenoliths, and that's what these little green blobs inside of this darker black rock is. And so all of these little green and or red spots in here represent literally pieces of the mantle that have been grabbed from about roughly 300 kilometers deep below our feet and have been brought up to the surface. And so we've been analyzing these to try and understand something about the nature of the mantle. My colleague uh, Jeff Weber currently has projects working in uh, southwestern Montana uh, and just slightly over into the border if I remember correctly now. Um, into Wyoming, if I remember, uh, and he's. This is, these are some pictures from his field season a few years back, uh, where he's looking at understanding deformation in some of these complex, what we call shear zones, and trying to understand how these things are, are getting moved around inside of the Earth. He's also been working on the past uh, up in Saskatchewan. Uh, again, looking at how the overall tectonics have basically stitched together the ancient craton of the, that part of Canada. And in particular, he looks at mostly the mineral magnetite uh, in order to do this. And you can see in here, these are some of his, this is one of his field pictures as well as some of the rocks of what they look like out in the, the field themselves. My colleague Suzanne Moskowski is our marine geologist. She's in the marine science program. Uh, and she does a lot of work mostly with coastal uh, sedimentation. Um, but in some cases, it's also just simply doing things like mapping out the bottom of the seafloor out there, uh, or in some cases, the bottom of the estuary kinds of environments. Uh, and these are a couple of her students, uh, who are geology students in particular, digging through either uh, sediments, uh, or uh, this picture in the bottom left is them basically mapping out the subsurface seafloor. Uh, she also works in the uh, tidal marshes in the back bays to, again, understand how sedimentation is taking place in there. And these, this is one of her students uh, from a few years back taking what we call a, a core sample. And you can see that she is uh, holding this coring device and basically kind of kind of drilling your way down to collect a core of the sediment that then can be brought back into the lab. And you can see the students in here are describing it and probably sampling it uh, in order to look at how everything is working in the, the tidal marsh systems. So the other thing that kind of makes this a little more special is the fact that all of our students are end up going on and presenting their research at the international and national conferences that we attend. And for the most part, we typically go to the Geologic Society of America's Northeastern Conference um, because it's, it's, it's an excellent forum for the students to present their data at and it gives them the opportunity to engage with experts from all over the country as well as parts of Canada and sometimes uh, overseas in, in Europe and things like that. Um, and these show you four of our student posters from a variety of different years. 
Uh, unfortunately, nobody presented last, this past year because of the uh, coronavirus canceling the conference, but the two on the left were from last year's presentation and the two on the right were from two years before that. So I guess that's three years ago now. So all of our students are required to do these presentations. Uh, and again, in a lot of cases, these offer the students the opportunity to engage with these experts, but also look for things like potential graduate school advisors and potential employers. And it, it, it's just a great experience for the students to experience this uh, firsthand. So the other thing that I want to point out is the fact that while the geology program had does all of this kind of stuff. There is an, a related student organization that is closely tied with the geology program, uh, and that is the Geology Club. I am the faculty advisor for it. Uh, and part of the reason why I mentioned the club is the fact that while it is open to everybody across campus, usually it tends to be dominated by the geology majors and minors, but we have typically even had students from health sciences, criminal justice, mathematics, chemistry, sociology, we've had literally everybody across campus can join the geology club. But the geology club is revolves around three main things. The first is that we do additional field trips. These are all student run uh, field trips, but we typically end the semester with a two to two and a half week long trip uh, someplace that we can't necessarily get to with a, a, a class trip through an extended weekend. So usually we go out to places like Arizona. Um, that's where the bottom left picture is, as well as the top right picture is. You can see there's a picture taken from Carlsbad Caverns uh, in uh, New Mexico, dead center. And then the lower right picture is taken from uh, Arizona, sorry, not from Arizona, but from Utah. So we typically go out west. Some years we have gone up to parts of Canada. Uh, we did the Atlantic provinces of Newfoundland, um, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia a few years back. But every year we go someplace that's a little bit more uh, interesting and diverse than, than what we would just get with our class trips alone. So they also do day trips as well to places like the uh, Sterling Hill mine up in New North Jersey, up in uh, Ogdensburg technically. Um, and then they get tours and things like that. The other main aspect of the Geology Club that I want to point out is the fact that they do a lot of educational outreach uh, through school districts all across New Jersey. Um, they've gone everywhere from places like Howell all the way down to Cape May Courthouse over west to Mount Laurel. Sorry, um, well, I guess technically Mount Laurel School District, but the Lenape District in general. Uh, they will go out and, and teach kids of a variety of different ages about what geology is, what rocks and minerals are, and to a certain degree, depending on the exact uh, teacher's request, they can also talk about fossils and things like that. So the geology club is very closely related to the geology program. And uh, again, uh, it is open to everybody across the campus, but usually the, almost all the geology majors and minors end up being part of the club because it's just an additional uh, experience and opportunity. Um, and these just kind of, I wanted to wrap up showing you a couple of the pictures from some of the, the recent trips. And you can see that uh, we go really cool places. The, the, even the class trips go to really cool and fun places. Um, but overall speaking, these are not the kinds of opportunities that you will get if you go to most other schools and, or universities. Um, but I mean, I, I will kind of leave it with this. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, again, it's on both the website um, specifically for the geology program, but you can also, if you are just watching this, you can write it down that uh, my email address is just my name, matthew.sievers at stockton.edu. So feel free to shoot me any e questions that you might have, concerns or uh, interest in the program. So if there are no other questions, I will go ahead and sign out. So I hope that you guys have learned something about geology uh, and will consider coming to Stockton for it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.